Good morning. For those of you uh, that I have yet to meet, my name is Todd Still, and I want to welcome you to the 2021-2022 Wilson Addis Endowed Lecture. As I do, I would like to thank the seminary's lecture and scholarship committee comprised of Kimlin Bender Chair, Andy Arterberry, Brian Brewer, Joel Gregory, and Rebecca Poe Hayes. It is they who do the work behind the scenes that make this lecture possible. The Wilson Addis Lectureship was established to honor the Wilsons and their daughter, Ora Jean Wilson Addis, and is meant to examine a foundational aspect of Christian faith and practice. Previous lecturers who may be a part of any branch of the Judeo-Christian tradition include Thomas Oden, Dallas Willard, Diana Garland, Robin Lovin, Ronald Sider, Stanley Grins, Richard Hayes, Ellen Cherry, Glenn Stassen, David Bevington, James D.G. Dunn, Philip Jenkins, Kenda Cressy Dean, Kimlin Bender, Ellen Davis, Amos Young, Luke Powery, and Nancy Murphy. We've been at this for a while now. This year, we are delighted to have as our Wilson Addis lecturer, Dr. Elizabeth Shively. Dr. Shively presently serves as senior lecturer in New Testament studies and director of teaching in the School of Divinity within St. Mary's College at the University of And St. Andrew, Scotland. Having previously taught at Wheaton College, Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and Candler School of Theology, and having served six years in pastoral ministry, Dr. Shively has been at St. Andrews since 2012. Dr. Shively earned her Bachelor of Arts from the University of the South, Sewanee, the MA and the THM from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and a PhD in religion at Emory University with a primary concentration in New Testament studies and a secondary concentration in homiletics. Dr. Shively's academic specialization is the Gospel of Mark, on which she has numerous publications. In addition, she is editor for the Routledge Interdisciplinary Perspectives on Biblical Criticism monograph series and serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Biblical Studies. Dr. Shively is an elected member of the Society for New Testament Studies, was awarded the McCall McBain Teaching Excellence Award at the University of St. Andrews, and is a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Finally, Dr. Shively is committed to public engagement out of a desire to make a contribution to both church and society. She fulfills this commitment through preaching, conference speaking, and regular contributions to Christianity Today and workingpreacher.org. Dr. Shively is married to Todd, and they have two young adult sons, Evan and Jack. Additionally, Dr. Shively has two sisters who happen to be with us today. Welcome. After uh, we are led in a hymn by Adam Dubberly, our coordinator of chapel, uh, Dr. Shively will come to lecture on The King Worth Following, Discipleship According to Mark's Gospel. Welcome to chapel. Welcome to the Wilson Addis Lecture. Thank you, Dean Still, and good morning, Truett family. We're so glad that you are here this morning. The next time you see uh, the workers from the administration office, if you see Jennifer or Nancy Plotz, tell them how grateful we are for them because due to the Easter holiday, I took it upon myself to print your lyric sheets today and I woefully misjudged the number of sheets to print. So they would have not made the same mistake. So hopefully if you got one of those, you can look on with someone that has one next to you and you can share and we can be generous this morning. Will you stand as we sing? Mine are days that God has numbered I was made to walk with Him Yet I look for worldly treasure 
and foresee the King of Kings. But mine is hope, my Redeemer. Though I fall, His love is sure. For Christ has paid for every failing. I am His forevermore. are tears in times of sorrow, darkness not yet understood. And though I valley, I must travel where I see no earthly good. But mine is peace that flows from heaven and the strength in times of need i know my pain will not be wasted christ completes his work in me in mine are days here as a stranger pilgrim on a narrow way one with Christ I will encounter harm and hatred for his name. But mine is armor for this battle, strong enough to last the war. And he has said he will deliver safely to the golden. And mine are keys to Zion City, where beside the King I walk. For there my heart has found its treasure, Christ is mine forevermore. Yes, mine are keys to Zion City, where beside the King I walk, there my heart has found its treasure, Christ is mine forevermore, yes, Christ is mine forevermore. Thank you, you may be seated. Good morning. Thank you for being here. It is such a privilege to be with you all this morning. Like many of you, I've been consumed by the war in Ukraine. I'm a news junkie anyway, and this war has made it, uh, taken it to another entire realm. Maybe, like me, you've been impressed by President Volodymyr Zelensky's speeches to governing bodies in Europe and North America. When Zelensky spoke to Congress, he showed photos of what Ukraine cities looked like before and after the Russians bombed them. And then he spoke in terms that made sense to Americans, and I quote, remember Pearl Harbor, terrible morning of December 7th, 1941, when your sky was black from the planes attacking you. Just remember it. Remember September 11th, a terrible day in 2001, when evil tried to turn your cities, independent territories, into battlefields, when innocent people were attacked from air, just like nobody else expected it, you couldn't stop it. Our country experienced the same every day. Zelensky also said that when Americans hear the words, I have a dream, this evokes the same feelings as when he says, I have a need to protect our sky. <laughs> 
And finally, he said, in your great history, you have pages that would allow you to understand the Ukrainian history. Understand us now. Do you see what Zelensky did there? He took stories that Americans have told themselves over the last 75 years, and he reinterpreted them in light of a new crisis. Zelensky aimed for something that Ivan Illich says in his book, Storytelling and Mythmaking. It is this, and I quote, neither revolution nor reformation can ultimately change society. Rather, you must tell a more powerful tale, one so persuasive that it sweeps away the old myths and becomes the preferred story. Zelensky told a more powerful tale with a climax and a resolution, and it became the preferred story. The climactic moments of World War II, of the civil rights movement, of the war on terror, these generated the unity and involvement of the world. Zelensky said, your story is our story. And he invited Americans to play out the same plot. At this climactic moment, will Americans now rally? Zelensky got change, even if he didn't get the change he wanted. His story held off counter-narratives, that Putin has a right to his actions, that this vague and faraway war isn't our concern. Just hours after the speech, President Biden pledged hundreds of millions of dollars in security assistance and weapons. My talk this morning is on discipleship according to Mark. And I've told you these things because the main point I want you to take away this morning is this. Mark told a story more powerful than any other to help people understand Jesus and how to follow him. It joins suffering and death and resurrection. And discipleship doesn't work without embracing the more powerful story. I think I can confidently assume that just about everyone in here thinks that following Jesus is important. I want you to take a moment and picture someone who's a disciple, someone who follows Jesus. Maybe you'll picture yourself. Maybe you'll picture someone else. What is this disciple like? What are their qualities? I have a feeling that most of us picture a disciple as someone who imitates a mentor. I have two boys. As Todd mentioned, they have been discipled through an organization called Young Life, which came to Scotland almost as soon as we moved there. And we are very grateful. Over the years, the leader has spent time with both of them individually, talking, praying, just hanging out. In fact, I asked my, uh, my younger son what he thought of when he thought of discipleship, and the first thing that popped out of his mouth was relationship. Maybe you equate discipleship with discipline. My boys have gone to a young life discipleship camp where they learned to practice things like praying and fasting and I can tell you that fasting is not very easy for teenage boys. In any case, imitation, disciplines, I have a feeling that these are the things we imagine when we think of discipleship. It wasn't so different in the ancient world. In fact, Greek historians like Herodotus had disciples. Philosophers like Socrates had disciples. In the Jewish scriptures, Elisha was a disciple of Elijah. You live with a master, you learn what they teach, you follow their lifestyle, and if you finally get it, then you go out and make your own disciples. So it wasn't that unusual for Jesus then to call disciples. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus teaches his disciples how to obey the principles of God's kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount. 
Then at the end of the gospel, Jesus gives what we call the Great Commission. You now go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. But this morning, I want to show you discipleship from Mark's gospel. Mark shows some of what we would expect. Jesus spends time with his disciples. In fact, the first thing he calls them to is to be with him. He asks them to adopt his teaching, his lifestyle. But Mark shows us more. In Mark, Jesus calls disciples to embrace a story more powerful than any other story. It's a movement with a future beyond what is visible to the naked eye. And with them, without embracing this more powerful story, discipleship doesn't work. To make this point, I'm going to address three questions. First, what is Mark's more powerful story? Second, how does Mark tell it? And especially, I'm going to focus on the disciples, if you hadn't guessed that. And third, what does this mean for discipleship in our living and our teaching and our preaching? The first, what is Mark's more powerful story? On my way to answering this question, I want to take a pit stop and acknowledge that some of you might be skeptical of using the word story to describe what Mark is up to, perhaps for different reasons. Some of you may resist the idea that Mark is a coherent story at all. A current trend in scholarship right now is to see Mark's gospel as either a collection of disordered episodes or unfinished notes. On either view, Mark just doesn't hang together. In my view, though, two of the major things that show how this gospel hangs together as a story are the way Mark uses scripture, and the way Mark develops characters. In fact, I hope it will become clear how these two features are interrelated. I'll get to scripture later, but for now, for now I'll say something about the characters I'm interested in this morning, which are the disciples. They're a group character, you can think of them sort of like uh, the Greek chorus or the muses or the fates, or like the Roman army in the histories of Tacitus, if you happen to read such things. Individuals can be singled out from among group characters, but the group functions as a whole and highlights something about the main character or action. So in Genesis, Jacob's sons function as a group character, for instance. Sometimes individuals like Reuben, or Benjamin are singled out, but the group helps us to see something we otherwise wouldn't see about Joseph and about God and about suffering. You meant it for evil, Joseph says, but God meant it for good. Mark's disciples are a group character. Mark names them in a list and often singles out Peter, James, and John, but most often the disciples speak and act as one. They're important because they help us to see something we wouldn't otherwise see about Jesus and what it means to follow him. And it is this, people may follow Jesus around, but without embracing the more powerful story, they risk not being followers at all. So yes, Mark is a coherent story due to its scripture and its characters, among other things. Others of you might resist the word story because it suggests something invented. Ivan Illich, whom I quoted a few moments ago, uses story interchangeably with tale and myth. So you might resist because the word tale is usually preceded by fairy and the word myth conjures images of Zeus and Hera and Isis. These words can suggest things that are made up, but this isn't what Illich means, and it's not what I mean. On one level, I use story to mean that Mark joins agents with actions in a cause and effect sequence. 
My husband Todd and I will celebrate our 25th anniversary this summer. And I remember when we first got engaged, people were constantly asking me to tell them how it happened, and so I told a story. I selected and arranged the details of what I wanted to say. I'd been waiting and waiting and waiting for what seemed like forever for Todd to pop the question. And finally, at Christmas time, the year that I had been waiting and waiting and waiting, I was visiting him at his parents' house and he took me to a restaurant and he pulled out a sonnet that he had written. He was an English major. And he read it out to me. He had written it for me, if you hadn't caught that. And then the climactic moment came when he pulled out the ring and asked me to marry him. And the resolution, of course, was that I said yes. We tell stories to help us organize our thoughts and give meaning to our experiences. Cognitive scientist Mark Turner even says that the everyday mind is essentially literary. Cognitive science confirms what's already plain to see. People have been telling stories to make sense of their experiences since the Bronze Age. We see this in the Jewish scriptures, for example, in the book of Deuteronomy. God said that when children would inevitably ask their parents, why are we living differently than everyone else around? They should tell a story. This is from Deuteronomy 6. You shall say to your children, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The Lord displayed before our eyes great and awesome signs and wonders against Egypt, against Pharaoh, against all his household. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in, to give us the land that he promised on oath to our ancestors. Then the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our lasting good, so as to keep us alive, as is now the case. If we diligently observe this entire commandment before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, we will be in the right. If God's people were to keep following him in the face of counter-narratives, they would need to tell and retell the more powerful story of God's redemption. On another level, I use story like Illich uses myth to capture one way that Mark uses his scriptures. And it might help to add C.S. Lewis's understanding of myth. Lewis defines a good myth as a story out of which every varying meanings will grow for different readers in different ages. One author has said that for Lewis, myths in the Bible are not about the non-historical, but about the non-describable. To make this idea con concrete, let's return to the story of the Exodus. This story has fueled more powerful stories about the work of God from its reuse in scripture to its reuse in the speeches of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so the Exodus has become a more powerful story out of which ever varying meanings have grown for different ages and different readers. Generation after generation has said, that story is our story. Within the Jewish scripture, Isaiah famously reinterpreted the story of the Exodus in a new crisis. And he did it for the exiles of Babylon. The people had experienced judgment for their sin, and now Isaiah speaks comfort to their situation. Their judgment is over, their sin is paid in full. Like God redeemed Israel from slavery to Egypt, God is about to bring the exiles out of their captivity to Babylon. Their suffering is over. 
they have the keys to Zion, as we just sang, where God is king. This more powerful story would have helped people understand their place in God's history, and it would have helped build up their hope in God's promises of redemption. If God's people recognize that this story is our story, then they know the resolution of the plot even while they're still suffering. Isaiah and this new exodus fuel Mark's more powerful story. Isaiah's telling of God's redemption comes to a climax in the story of the suffering servant. I'm sure you have Isaiah 52 and 53 fresh in your minds from Holy Week. There we learn about how God's servant accomplishes the redemption of the exiles. The servant is a righteous sufferer who willingly lays down his life to make many righteous. And because of his service, God will vindicate him so that he is highly exalted and he will see an offspring. We often stop reading there, but we can't because the plot continues. The last part of Isaiah, the last third, describes a righteous community that has returned from exile. Not only do they have the keys to Zion, but they've arrived. The problem is that things aren't what they expected. Their home is devastated. The project of temple rebuilding seems impossible. The community is divided with a faction hostile towards those who obey God's commands. And the burning question is this, how can the righteous suffer after returning from exile? Isaiah answers this question by reinterpreting the image of the servant for this new situation. And here's how it works. The writer takes what was said about the servant, things that we read and heard about the servant during Holy Week, and applies it to a group of servants who are the promised offspring of that servant. The language of servants and offspring appears in a number of places in the last part of Isaiah, but there's a verse that captures what's going on. In Isaiah 65, 9, we read this. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and from Judah inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it and my servants shall settle there. Just like the servant suffered for righteousness, so did they. Just like the servant was promised vindication, so were they. And so Isaiah 54, 17 says that no weapon that is fashioned against you shall prosper, and you shall confute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication is from me, says the Lord. To put it simply, the writer tells a more powerful story than counter-narratives that question God's presence or the value of obedience by saying that the servant's story is our story. The way Isaiah reused the story of the servant to tell this more powerful story in a new situation created what Jacob Stromberg calls an interpretive revolution. Consider how Daniel reuses language about the servant for his situation. The pertinent texts from Isaiah are these. Isaiah 52, 13 says, My servant shall act wisely. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Isaiah 53, 11 says that the righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous. And so Daniel takes up what was said about the servant and applies it to a group of servants, the righteous. Daniel 12, 1 to 3 says that those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise 
shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever. Daniel tells a more powerful story to persuade God's people not to abandon the covenant when they're terrorized by foreign rulers. Whereas Isaiah said that God's chosen servant acts wisely, will be exalted and lifted up and will make many righteous, Daniel speaks of the chosen ones who are wise, who will lead many to righteousness and be exalted to eternal life. He says, in a sense, if you suffer for righteousness like the servant, you will be vindicated and exalted like the servant because his story is your story. Isaiah's interpretive revolution spread over and over again. Writers in new situations of suffering conveyed that the servant story is our story. The servant story fuels more powerful stories to combat counter-narratives within Jewish scriptures, like Psalm 22 and 69, and in Zechariah, and in Second Temple writings like Second Maccabees and Qumran literature, and in the New Testament, like the Christ hymn in Philippians 2. We're not going to read all of these, so this will be your homework. The servant fuels Mark's more powerful story. As far as we know, Mark was the first to tell the story of the good news in written form. At its center was a Messiah executed as a criminal on a Roman cross. Mark's first reading communities knew about the crucifixion. They knew about eyewitness reports of the resurrection. Maybe some were even among those about whom Paul refers when he says that the risen Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time in 1 Corinthians 15. Mark's earliest readers had the spirit. They practiced baptism and they shared the Lord's Supper. Could there be a better recipe for productive Christian discipleship? The problem was that the world was still not as it should be. Jesus may have announced the good news of God's coming reign, but it was difficult to see. Competing narratives said that this good news isn't good at all. Paul wrote about some of these competing narratives. The weakness of the good news is offensive to Jews and nonsense to Greeks. Rome offered a powerful narrative, painting its emperor as a quasi-messiah and even a god. A famous monument called the Prean Calendar Inscription stated that the kingdom of Caesar Augustus would bring a new era of peace from war and salvation to all who pledged their loyalty. This inscription states that the birthday of Caesar Augustus was the beginning of the good news for the world. Into this world, Mark tells a more powerful story that Jesus and his disciples share. The good news is that the God of Israel is indeed coming to reign in Jesus, not in spite of his suffering and death, but because of it. And his followers enter God's reign, not in spite of their suffering and death, for those who experienced it, but because of it. Mark conveys this by using the servant's story. I may have provoked another group of skeptics, those of you who wonder if Mark's readers could possibly have recognized this plot. I think so because, as I've already said, the story of the servant was in the air at the time Mark wrote. Those who suffer for righteousness like the servant, God vindicates like the servant. Writers were telling that story over and over and over again. And people who knew this plot, well, they didn't need uh, explicit correspondences to recognize it. 
the creators of the Lion King intentionally patterned the story after Shakespeare's Hamlet. Co-director Rob Minkoff explained why. The Lion King was considered an original story. And so he says, there was always the need to anchor it in something familiar. Snow White had Grimm's fairy tales, Cinderella came from Greek myth, but the Lion King needed a founding story to create a cultural touchstone, and the creators settled on Hamlet. The two stories share a general plot. A prince is destined to become king, but his uncle murders his father and takes the throne. The prince flees the kingdom. The ghost of the murdered king appears to the prince to guide him. Now, people unfamiliar with Hamlet, so most of those two and three-year-olds out there, right, can still understand and enjoy the Lion King. They can enjoy it without making those connections. If any of you are parents, you know that most animated, animated movies have another level of writing to keep the parents entertained. But those who do know Hamlet will recognize illusions and be able to make predictions. So for instance, when Mufasa appears to Simba in a dream, we can predict that Simba is going to return to avenge his father. Illusions like this provide a consistency in meaning and help us to recognize departures. So while Hamlet contemplates the circle of death with the to be or not to be speech, the Lion King lands on the circle of life. Readers familiar with the story of Isaiah's servant would recognize the plot. Mark portrays Jesus as the fulfillment of Isaiah's servant and his mission. But Mark also extends what is said about the servant to Jesus' followers. These are his servants, his offspring, who continue his mission after he's gone. I'm going to move on to my second point, which is this, or my second question. How does Mark tell this more powerful story through his portrayal of the disciples? Mark's portrayal of the disciples goes hand in hand with his portrayal of Jesus. As Mark tells it, Jesus announces the good news that God's kingdom is finally infiltrating the world. And the first thing he does after, uh, after announcing that the kingdom of God is near is to call disciples. They respond by leaving their livelihood and their family ties to follow him. As the story continues, the disciples do what Jesus teaches. And when other, others question Jesus about them, why aren't they fasting? Why are they picking grain on the Sabbath and eating it? He defends their acts of following as good practice. Soon, Jesus sets apart the 12 to imitate him. He gives them authority to preach the good news and cast out demons, just like he's been doing. After this, Mark describes how Jesus creates a new community. Jesus and his disciples have just retreated to a house, and those who should be closest to him attack his ministry. His kin call him crazy, and some scribes call him possessed. But Jesus insists on the integrity of his mission. Central to what Jesus has to say is a parable. In Mark 3, 27, Jesus says, No one is able to enter a strong man's house to plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Just after this, his family comes to the house where he's teaching, looking for him, and Jesus says that his true family are those around him who do God's will. By putting these two scenes next to each other, Jesus' parable, that he's the stronger one who enters the strong man's house to plunder his goods and wrest them from the strong man, who in this parable is Satan. By putting this scene next to the scene where Jesus is in the house 
reconstituting his family, Mark suggests that Jesus rescues people from one house to put them in another where they become the community that does God's will. Mark's use of scripture here suggests that there's even more than that to see. This parable uses language from Isaiah. The prophet has spoken of the people as plunder. He says they have become the spoils and the plunder. The plunder, uh, and there was no one to rescue the prey and no one to say restore. Because of their captivity, someone with greater power and authority was needed to overthrow the mighty enemy. And so Isaiah continues a little later. Will anyone take the spoils from a giant? If one should take a giant captive, he will take spoils, and by taking them from a strong man, he will be saved. It turns out we keep reading Isaiah, that God was the only one who could redeem the people who had become the plunder. And this redemption culminates in the ministry of the servant described in Isaiah 53.12. In Isaiah 53.12, we read that the servant who has suffered inherits the spoils of the mighty because his soul was delivered to death. The point I want to make here is that Mark uses the language of the servant's redemption and the inheritance of offspring to describe how Jesus rescues and creates a family of disciples. For Mark, the servant's story is Jesus' story, and it's his disciples' story. As we keep reading, we learn more about this new family. Jesus says that they have the mystery of God's kingdom. Unlike hard-hearted outsiders who receive everything in parables, they have the benefit of Jesus' private teaching. So far, doesn't it seem like we have all the necessary building blocks of successful discipleship? But almost right away, Jesus' disciples botch it up. After Jesus teaches in parables, he gets in a boat with his disciples to go to the other side of the sea. I want you to notice how Mark tells this story. He says, on that day when evening had come, it's the same day that Jesus had told the parable of the sower. The same day he said they'd been given the mystery of God's kingdom. It's the same day he was said to have given them special teaching. On that day, the disciples are in a boat with Jesus and a storm whips up and they think they're going to die. Jesus asks, why are you afraid? The word here means cowardly. Why are you cowards? Have you still no faith? The disciples believe the storm threatens their lives, but Jesus demonstrates that they have misunderstood the storm as a threat because they've misunderstood him. He calms the storm, and now the disciples respond in fear. This time the word means awe. They ask, who then is this? For them, Jesus remains a mystery. As the story unfolds, Jesus' disciples continue to go downhill in their understanding. Their imperception comes to a climax after the second feeding miracle, when they're again on the boat with Jesus. They're concerned that they'd forgotten to bring bread. They had one loaf, but that was it. And Jesus uses this as an instructional opportunity to warn them against the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. The Pharisees, for example, had just asked Jesus for a sign from heaven right after, he uh, uh, sorry, right after he amply provided a sign from heaven in the multiplication of the loaves. The disciples missed the point, though. They believe that Jesus is referring to the fact that they have no bread. 
Jesus responds with leading questions, which only serve to expose that they are now the outsiders with hard hearts and poor senses. We're on a whistle-stop tour of Mark, if you haven't noticed. And now we've come to the center of Mark's story. Jesus, with his disciples, are on the way to Jerusalem. There's a concentration of way language in chapters 8 to 10, and this evokes Mark's opening quotation from Isaiah. Prepare the way of the Lord. Mark takes up Isaiah's way of the Lord motif again to interpret Jesus' movement with his disciples as they go towards Jerusalem. As they're on the way, Jesus instructs his disciples about the nature of his mission and theirs. And here, Jesus follows the pattern of Isaiah's servant, who is the disciple of God. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4, we read that the Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakes. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. God taught the servant so that the servant could enlighten others. For Isaiah to walk in the way of the Lord, Isaiah uses this language constantly, requires divine guidance. It requires the divine guidance of a teacher who's been taught by God. And this is because God's people are blind or captive, and they choose their own way rather than God's way. In fact, Isaiah speaks about those who fumble on the way like the blind. And he speaks about the healing of the blind on the way. I think it's significant then that this section of Mark, chapters 8 to 10, is framed by miracle stories where Jesus provides physical sight to blind men, showing that his disciples need spiritual perception on the way. Jesus is the teacher. His disciples are the blind who need his enlightenment. And there does appear to be some enlightenment, but it's only partial, like the partial healing of the blind man in the first story. Peter, the spokesman for the group, finally confesses what Mark said at the beginning. Jesus is the Messiah, God's anointed. The disciples seem to realize that they are the entourage of the most famous guy around. This is where the understanding starts to slip. This makes them important. They've got what I once heard a preacher called, call PIP, power, influence, and popularity. And so they try to shield Jesus from bothering with the nobodies, the children, the beggars, the blind. No baby kissing for you, Jesus. You've got Pip. At one point, the disciples tell Jesus to ban an exorcist who is casting out demons in his name because they say, he's not following us. We've got Pip. And they ask Jesus for the highest status in the kingdom they imagine he will bring. Can we sit on your right and your left in your kingdom? We've got to flex our Pip. If following Jesus means Pip, then the disciples are all in. He's the Messiah they've been waiting for. As they travel with Jesus towards Jerusalem, they expect a revolution. They expect a conquering king. But Jesus gives them a suffering servant. Three times, Jesus says that he will become king by suffering, dying, and rising. How is it that the Messiah, the exalted Son of Man, can suffer and die? Jesus explains it by telling a more powerful story. The servant's story is my story. He uses language from Isaiah to say that the Son of Man will be handed over to death. The Gentiles will mock him and spit on him and flog him. The Son of Man language evokes Daniel's exalted figure from Daniel 7, the one like a Son of Man. But unlike in Daniel, Mark's son of man rises to his glorified status only after suffering and dying. This 
redefined image upsets conventional expectations of a political revolution. And so Peter, again the spokesman for the group, takes Jesus aside to correct him because messiahs don't die. If Jesus would be king, he can't say things like this, the things that are so bizarre, so disgraceful, so humiliating. Peter rebukes Jesus and tries to convince him to deny his mission. But Jesus rebukes Peter right back and calls him to deny himself. Jesus says that any who wish to follow him must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. This is what following means. In fact, Jesus calls together a large crowd to define discipleship more precisely. If anyone wants to follow me, he says. This kind of following isn't only for professional disciples, it's for everyone. This means losing your life to save it, it means forfeiting the world to gain your life. It means refusing to be ashamed of Jesus and the good news, even when there's everything to lose. Reputation, money, even life itself. It's believing that because you follow Jesus, you have everything to gain. But Peter and the rest of the disciples prefer another narrative in which the glory of the good news comes out, it comes without any self-sacrifice. Mark's earliest readers may not have been much different. And if we're honest, neither are we. We don't hear this in our altar calls. Come follow Jesus and you may face the loss of friends, family, reputation, career, and possibly your own life. Three times Jesus said he would become king by suffering, dying, and rising, and three times the disciples missed the plot. We expect that the disciples should increase in their understanding of who Jesus is as they spend time with him, but instead they grow more and more imperceptive, like the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida. The partial sight they have been given requires additional revelation for them to see fully. Now Jesus and his disciples are about to enter Jerusalem. James and John exhibit their failure to hear by asking to be seated at Jesus' right and left in the kingdom they imagine Jesus will bring. I alluded to that earlier. The other disciples take offense. Apparently, they have their own aspirations. To expose the attitude of his followers, Jesus uses the acts of Gentile rulers as a negative example. He contrasts the way they seek greatness, the way they lord their greatness over others, with the way his followers must seek greatness. Jesus says, their way is not to be your way. Rather, the one who wishes to become great must become a servant. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. And this is why. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, don't be great, don't be first, don't live. Instead, the point is that those who follow Jesus and enter God's reign can only do it the way he does through self-sacrificial service. Mark shows that following Jesus isn't easy. In fact, Jesus says that it's almost impossible. At one point, Jesus calls a man to sell all he has and give it to the poor and follow him. And the man can't because he's rich. He walks away from Jesus, unable to embrace eternity, choosing to keep the world and forfeit his soul. Jesus then says how hard it is for a rich man to enter God's kingdom, and his disciples are amazed because this pious rich man has Pip. He's got all the necessary resources for successful following. Peter despairs and says, if a man like this can't be saved, then what chance do any of us have? And Jesus answers, the message puts it this way, there's no chance. There's no chance at all 
if you think you can pull it off by yourself. There's every chance in the world if you let God do it. Even with this teaching under their belt, the disciples can't imagine the plot. They approach Jerusalem where kings are made and messianic excitement is filling the air. But Jesus predicts that they're going to abandon and deny him. They all insist he's wrong. They insist that they get it now. They're ready to die with him. They think they have the capacity to stand firm under pressure, but it turns out they can't. They want to follow Jesus, but they can't stay awake. They can't pray. They can't fight off the temptations that draw them away. They've finally gotten to the climax of the plot. They're willing to suffer and die for the sake of the Messiah who would suffer and die. But the problem is that they don't ever get the resolution. Those who suffer like the servant, who suffer like Jesus, will be vindicated and exalted like him. They don't get that the servant's story is their story. Jesus' story is their story. And so when Jesus is arrested and tried as a criminal, they abandon and deny him as he said. And we don't see them again for the rest of the story. Third, what does this tell us about discipleship? Or, I can say now, what are the disciples good for anyway if they don't get the plot? I think Mark wants us to see two things, one about Jesus and the other about what it means to follow him. First, Jesus wasn't the king of anyone's expectations, of his disciples' expectations, and this is because their expectations were too small. They wanted a strong man to deliver them from Rome, but Jesus overcame the strong man to deliver them from evil. They wanted to follow Jesus into Jerusalem, but he called them to follow him into God's kingdom. They wanted good news that promises the whole world, but Jesus, by his death and resurrection, guarantees the good news that gains them eternal life. In short, Jesus underwrites the more powerful narrative. This is only possible because he believed it. When he hung on the cross, Jesus entrusted himself to God's will, believing that he would suffer, die, and rise, just as he predicted three times. He identified the Passover meal as his body and blood poured out for many, believing that he would feast anew in God's kingdom. Jesus talks about two feasts there. He predicted his disciples would abandon and deny him, knowing he would meet them again, alive in Galilee. And he spoke boldly to the high priest, who condemned him to death, knowing that he would be exalted as the Son of Man to the right hand of God. Jesus knew the servant's story, and he knew that the servant's story was his story. Like the servant, Jesus was the disciple of God. He did God's will by suffering and dying so that God vindicates him by raising him from the dead. In the end, Jesus, like the servant, is the disciple of God, the only one who ever gets the logic of the plot that moves from suffering to dying to rising. He's the one for followers to imitate. But the disciples' story shows us also something about following Jesus. And here's the second thing I want to say on this topic. On one hand, the disciples' problem seems to be ours, as we still struggle to see Jesus. In signposts in a strange land, the Southern writer Walker Percy says that bad books always lie. They lie most of all about the human condition so that no one ever recognizes oneself, the deepest part of oneself, in a bad book. I think Mark is a good book, and Mark allows us to see the human condition and to see ourselves in it. When we look, we may respond with Peter 
and say, who can be saved? And Jesus' response is that for God, all things are possible. On the other hand, the disciples' problem is a historical one. They desperately need spiritual sight, but Mark locates revelation after Jesus' resurrection. On the way down the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus tells Peter, James, and John not to tell anyone that what they had seen until after he had risen from the dead. And Jesus promised to meet his runaway disciples in Galilee to lead them as a shepherd once more after he is raised. Finally, at the empty tomb, the divine young man repeats this promise in his command to the women, go tell the disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee and there you will see him alive. To embrace the more powerful story requires spiritual sight for a time after Jesus was raised. And I'm coming to the end here. Fortunately for us, Jesus speaks to his disciples about that time. And he does it in chapter 13. In verses 9 to 13, and I'm just going to leave it here on the screen for you to read, and those of you tuning in can read chapter 13, 9 to 13. I want to remember how Jesus used language about Isaiah's servant to predict his suffering and death and resurrection. Now Jesus repeats that language to predict how his followers will imitate him. Three times he says they will be handed over to affliction. And when they endure to the end, they will be saved. The Son of Man will come and gather them. We might consider this little section to predict the passion of the disciples. They're the servants who continue the mission of the servant after he's gone. Because they suffer like Jesus, they will be exalted like Jesus. Jesus' story is their story. Now you and I, Mark's earliest readers, have only ever known the risen Jesus. So even though we haven't seen Jesus, we're poised to perceive and follow him. But we still perceive through a glass darkly, waiting to see God face to face. In the meantime, we see Jesus in each other. The Apostle Paul knew this. He told people to imitate him and co-workers like Timothy and Epaphroditus only because they imitated Jesus' sufferings so that they might know his resurrection. Paul knew that Jesus' story was their story and the church's story. I'm going to end with this. In our family, we love the Marvel Universe. This is the universe of the Avengers, of Captain America, Iron Man, Black Widow, Black Panther. I can't even name all of the characters. It includes even a tiny tree and a raccoon. There's something for everyone. At least at our house, the stories of the Marvel Universe can make a grown man cry. This happened uh, at um, the end game. We might say that the Marvel Universe gives us the stories of our culture. And I say stories because there's not one plot, but many intertwined plots. In many ways, the multiplicity and diversity of the Marvel Universe reflects a postmodern resistance to the idea of a single grand narrative that can explain history and knowledge and experience. No matter your story, though, if you are a follower of Christ, then your story is joined to his. You do have a story his story is your story. His story is our story. It's a story more powerful than any other and the only foundation for discipleship. But the way Jesus replicates himself in our lives and in our churches is multiple and diverse. How might we tell our more powerful stories to describe what is non-describable? At one time or another, each one of us will drop the thread of the story and be enticed by another narrative. Like the disciples who fled at Jesus' arrest and the women who fled the empty tomb. We will find ourselves struggling to believe that God's kingdom really is breaking into the world to make everything right. And so we need to tell and retell the more powerful story in our teaching and our preaching 
and in our lives. Jesus' story is our story. Thank you.